injury is. Make sure I'm not upside down. Okay. Oh, right side up. Okay. Um, a chance to share. Now I need to get on Facebook. I mean, on on a uh, on uh, Excel. On Zoom. Zoom. Great. <laughs> what am I gonna get on Zoom with? Um, oh shoot. <laughs> I'm just not going to be on Zoom. I, Why not? I've got everything under. I've got everything here. No, I can't be on Zoom. <laughs> um, you want to use my tablet because i Yeah. Bible. Yeah, I'll need your tablet. Can you go on Zoom? Yeah. It's already got everything it needs. It just needs to have the numbers pushed in. Okay. Good. I know it. Okay, I'm back. I'm still trying to get everybody to move on. Running around like a chicken with my head cut off, trying to get all this back up again. Using the various uh, things we have, I don't, I don't begrudge it whatsoever. But there's so much more that I get set up for uh, our morning um, assembly. So I'm sorry if it has me being rushed and everything when everyone is is there. Using my Bible to to it. <laughs> I think you're going to need your Bible. Yeah. <clears throat> That's okay. I've got other Bibles. You all should see <laughs> Albert's table here. This is a suit. <laughs> yeah. And I'm using one of my technologies as my uh, as to hold my <laughs> other technology up. Are you still there, D? I'm still here. Okay, I've, I've got things set on top of you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, thanks. Okay, let's get to the time. It's a good one to, to start. Yeah. Three, three, three. It is. Albert? Wait a minute, someone's talking to you. Yeah, I'm here. What's up? Uh, are we ready? Uh, yes, sir. You go ahead. All right, we're going we're gonna to sing uh, Oh, the Fount of Every Blessing. We'll sing the uh, first, first verse, okay? Okay. And I'll try to give you an account that way we can just mm -hmm. stay on. Oh, the fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise, strings of mercy ever sing. Oh, 
Okay, we are going to be continuing our study of, uh, of the Bible. As you know, we've been studying uh, the Bible in uh, various sections. I want to remind us of what we've already looked at. You, could, uh, you can see there on the screen, um, we've studied the antediluvian age, the time period before the flood. That covers Genesis 1 through 6. Uh, we've, we've covered the flood and what followed immediately after the flood. 
in Genesis 7 through 11. And last week, or no, and this week, we'll be looking at the rest of the book of Genesis. Have you noticed that, by the way? How, we're, how what we're studying so far is all in the book of Genesis, finishing up the book of Genesis, and that is the largest portion of the Old Testament as far as time is concerned. Again, we're getting up, we're, we're getting up past, past Abraham. We're going to be seeing today in the patriarchal age, Abraham, his son Isaac, his grandson Jacob, and we're going to mention something at the very end about his great-grandson Judah and his great-great-grandson Perez. So, so keep all that in mind as we are as we are looking as we are looking at this. That these are the these are the ones that we are going uh, we are going through. Um, this is the time period that it, it covers, and and the rest of the Bible is basically going to be covering. Understand this: Moses was around fifteen hundred BC. In other words, 1,500 years before Christ, something like that, 1,500, 1,400, somewhere in that area, okay, just to give you an idea. Uh, the, everything we've covered up to this point is from 4,000 B.C. up until now, all right? So the very rest of the Bible, Exodus on, is going to be what we're going to be, is, is what, what we'll be studying following this. And is the time of Moses. Now, there's a 400 year period between the end of Genesis and the beginning of the book of Exodus. Rather interesting to note, just coincidentally, there's a 400 year period after the book of Malachi until we get to John the Baptist coming on the scene. All right. Uh, I don't know if God planned it that way or if that's just, if that's just what occurs, but we have this, we have this time period. Um, in between those that, again, reminds us that God's timing may not be our timing. All right. So let's consider the patriarchal age. Go ahead and do the next next slide. Um, it's going to be covering the books, the, the chapters 12 through 50 of the book of Genesis. And it's going to be covering this next slide. Next slide. It's going to be covering three men for the most part. This, uh, that we, we know very well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Next slide. In our genealogy that we show, uh, notice again the small genealogy, genealogical chain, part of the chain that we're looking at. Remember, Luke chapter 3 takes us all the way from Jesus all the way back to Adam. And we're going to be studying about, again, it works backwards, back to, back to Adam. So, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Judah, and Perez are all parts of that of that those chapters in Genesis. Now, our study today is a favorite one of mine, at least the point I'm wanting to make today. You know, we live in a world that looks at uh, the people of the Bible and uh, oftentimes think of them as our... Uh, uh, Painters of the Middle Ages would paint them with halos around their heads. These are holy people. Um, they are saints. I don't want to take that away from them. But we get this weird idea in our mind about saints. Saints are holier people than the rest of us. And when we look at God's word, when we look at his New Testament, we come to find out from the New Testament, and therefore we can understand this about the Old Testament as well, that God's people are all saints. That's a very important thing to note. Saints are not any more special than any other Christian because all Christians are saints. Understand that. And so these men are most certainly considered to be saints by a lot of people in the world, and they're right. And that's because they are God's people. But just because they are saints does not mean they didn't have flaws. Just because they are saints, because they're God's people, does not mean that there aren't things that are in their life that God didn't approve of. 
This lesson is important to me, especially, because I know I have my flaws. I have made my mistakes. Some of them, in my mind, being very, very bad, that I have had to have, that I have had to go to God in prayer about. Satan wants me to think that it's because of those things that I can no longer be acceptable to God. And I couldn't if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ when I come to him for forgiveness, uh, giving me salvation from the forgiveness from those sins. We're going to see the same thing about these men. Let's take their halos off. Seems how they never had them anyway. No such thing as a halo. But let's take let's take that off and see these um, see these men for how they are in God's eyes. First point, and we're going to be looking like we've always looked at God's plan to save in action. The next very next slide. Um, God's plan to save in action. Let's see how we can view that in this portion. As seen through faulty father Abraham. Now, I, I, I am so, I'm so uh, um, reluctant to use that word father, uh, but except for the fact that God's word uses it. And it doesn't use it the way we oftentimes do in our society as just some kind of title. This word was used by the man in Hades, the rich man in Hades, and it's because he was a descendant of Abraham. He was a Jew. And so he called Abraham his father because Abraham was his father. Okay, uh, we normally would use the word grandfather, or in this case, great, 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 untold number of greats, grandfather, Abraham. But for them, they didn't use that word grandfather. Anyone who was in their descendant, anyone who was in their genealogy, in their past, who was a male would be a father. And that's how in Luke chapter 16, the rich man identifies Abraham, his father, his ancestor. Okay, um, so, so, but he's a faulty man. What do I mean by that? Go to the next point. Abraham came from a family of idol worshipers. Let me get my Bible. It got, it walked off on me. Abraham is from a family of fi- well, idol worshipers. Did you realize that? Go with me to Joshua 24.2. Joshua 24.2. If you think there's something in your past that will keep you from being able to be useful to God. Look at what we see about Abraham. Abraham says in 24, it says about Abraham in 24 2. Um, chapter 24 2. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they, served other gods. Father of Abraham, father of Nahor, Nahor being Abraham's brother, uh, Terah being their father. They, those three, served other gods. There can be no doubt whatsoever. Abraham was brought up by Terah, who was an idol worshiper. And by inspiration, Joshua is saying here, Abraham and his brother Nahor, were idol worshipers. Okay, so where, where he starts off with is worshiping false gods. That's where Abraham had been. Again, I said this last week, and I'm sure I said it probably the week before. That's a wonderful thing about the Bible. The people in the Bible, we get to see them, flaws and all. Flaws and all. They, God does not whitewash the situation. And I think that's important for us to see. Because we are able to see how God can use us in this situation. Whatever your past is. Go to the next point. Fearful liar. In Genesis chapter 12. I'm not going to read these. You can read them on your own. Genesis chapter 12 verse 19. In Genesis chapter 20 verse 2. And, may, and you know, I kind of wish I would have had the word cowardly liar there. Okay. Just sounds too much like cowardly lion. And that's the Wizard of Oz. And that would really confuse me. But... Be that as it may. Cowardly liar. Okay? That word coward because Abraham was, at least in two different times in his life. He went into a nation with his wife Sarah, 
So at the, at the, in chapter 12, verse 19, he, she was known as Sarai at the time. But he went into, into, a, into two different nations, those two chapters, with his wife, who was recognized as a very beautiful woman. And when he went in those nations, he was afraid. Why was he afraid? Because he knew that sometimes evil men would kill someone to be able to have their wife. And so what, is, what does Abraham do? A hero of the Bible. And I don't want to take away from that. As far as I'm concerned, he is a hero of the Bible. But he has his flaws. Abraham told, in one place he was in Egypt, and he told Pharaoh this. And another time he spoke to Abimelech, another nation, uh, another, another name that merely is, was passed down like Pharaoh was for their kings. And you'll see why I mentioned that in a few moments. But Abraham told Pharaoh in chapter 12, and again, Abimelech in chapter 20, Sarah's my sister. Not only that, so that they wouldn't kill him for Sarah, he allowed them to take Sarah and put Sarah in his harem. And I don't think any of us have any illusions about what it means to be in someone's harem. They were going to be Pharaoh's uh, concubine, or if he wanted to marry them, his wife, so that he could have sexual relations with her. They could have sexual relations with her. Abraham allowed this. And when you look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 19, and Genesis chapter 20, verse 2, in each one of those instances, the reason he told Sarah to tell those men that Abraham was his, her brother is because he was afraid they would kill him and take her. So instead... He lied and gave her to him. That's Abraham. Okay. A, a husband who should be there to protect his wife. A husband who should be there to die for his wife. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5. Instead, he allowed Pharaoh to have his wife. Now, God stopped everything before anything sinful could happen in both cases. But, it, but do you know what it makes clear in, that, in each one of those contexts? Especially in chapter 20. Uh, chapter 20 makes it clear that, that uh, God, God says it. It's clear in both cases. But God said it to Abimelech, I know that you did not act incorrectly. Now, what's ironic about that? Well, what's ironic about that is, as Abraham did, Abraham, a follower of God at this time, acted incorrectly and the idol worshipers of an idol worshiper of Egypt and an idol worshiper, uh, Abimelech, another idol worshiper, acted correctly. In this case, we see the heathen acting better than the child of God. Okay, so even after he became a follower of God and God blessed him because of the way he was following him, Abraham was sinful. Next point. And because of that, he failed as a, as a husband twice, okay? He didn't do his job as a husband. Now the next point. God made something out of this sinner. He really did. Now to say all these bad things, to note, note these bad things about Abraham, and by the way, I'm sure these aren't the only sins that Abraham ever co uh, committed. Uh, Paul makes it clear that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Uh, John says in 1 John chapter 1 that if any man, any man says he's without sin, he's a liar. Okay, so I'm sure there are other sins, but these are the ones that God noted. Two of the ones that God noted within his word. But in each one of those other places, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and chapter 15, verse 4, and chapter 22, verses 15 through 18, God makes a covenant with Abraham. I want to look at the last one, the last one I mentioned, Genesis 22, 15 through 18. And look at how he says what he does there. The first two, the first one, John 12, or Genesis 12, 1 through 4, is where God calls Abraham and Abraham follows. And God tells him, you know, I'm going to bless, you know, I will bless you on your journeys and curse those who curse you. But look at what he says in, in uh, 22, 15 through 18. This is just after Abraham, after commanded by God to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, goes up on a mountain and prepares to do just that all the way up to the point of lifting up his knife to kill his son and God stops him. And look at what God says to Abraham here in verses 15 through 18 of Genesis 22. 
Then an angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars in the heaven and, a, and as on the sand, which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Verse 18. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now we know who that seed is. In his seed, Jesus came through Abraham. That's why we're studying Abraham. He's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Jesus came through Abraham. Paul uses this very point in Galatians chapter uh, 18. I'm not sorry. Right. In Galatians chapter 3, I'm sorry. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul uses this very words here. In your seed, all the nations will be, will be blessed. He uses that very point to, to make it clear that this was speaking about Jesus Christ. Why? Because Abraham had obeyed the Lord. Yes, the, the former idol worshiper, the former liar, the coward, Abraham, the man who failed his wife, Sarah, he was used by God in order to be able to bring about the Christ. And God approved of his obedience. But he did not approve, obviously, of his, of his sin. And so this is, this is important for us to note. We can beat ourselves over the head because of things we've done in the past. And perhaps rightfully so. Take the perhaps out. Rightfully so. But we shouldn't do it once that, those sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. We should recognize that God is able to take care of those sins. Sometimes there may be ramifications for those sins, earthly ramifications for those sins, but we should never consider ourselves to be guilty of those sins anymore. We should certainly not be able to think of ourselves as not being able to be used by God. So and go, ahead and, go ahead and go to the next part of the slide. So there you see uh, Abraham who was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac, was able to be in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and through him, a blessing to the entire world. Next point. Abraham's son. God's plan to save in action is seen through his son Isaac, who also, by the way, was a faulty father of Jesus Christ. Um, first, first point. Followed in his lying father's footsteps. In Genesis chapter 26, verse 7, you know how they often talk, talk about the idea that you need to be careful of your example in front of your children? Your children are basically going to grow up to be a, another you and do many of the same mistakes that you make. Well, in Genesis chapter 26, verse 7, Isaac learned from the best or the worst. His father Abraham. When he was before Abimelech, another king of that nation, not the same Abimelech, Okay, that was, that was a name of the kings of that nation. When he was before Abimelech in Genesis chapter 26, verse 7, he tells his wife, Rachel, I'm sorry, that's not right, Rebecca, he tells his wife, Rebecca, the exact same thing. Lie to him, tell me your sister. By the way, his father Abraham had one step on top of him. His father Abraham was married to his half-sister, <laughs> um, Sarah. All right. Uh, he was still lying. He was he was not including the fact that she also happened to be his wife, and therefore you shouldn't be committing adultery with her. But huh, Isaac didn't even have that little bit, which it's still a lie. But uh, in Genesis chapter twenty six verse seven, he tells he tells his wife to tell Abimelech the same thing to be able to save his skin. And so he was a cowardly liar. He also favored one son over another. In Genesis chapter 25, verses 27 through 28, something no parent should do. A very, a very difficult thing on a, the child who is not favored. Okay. He looked, he liked Esau better than his son Jacob. Uh, by the way, both of them had the problem because uh, his mother 
uh, Jacob's mother liked him better than Esau. And so I guess it kind of evened out a little bit. It just means that both of them were not liked as well by one of their parents. And so the, here we have this man, and once again, take the halos off. You know, not a very good, not a very good example of a parent. And, and he, he liked one better than the other, and they knew it. They, they knew that fact. Um, thirdly, but, but I'm sorry, yeah, and God made something out of this sinner. In Genesis chapter 26, I want to read this. Genesis 26, verses 1 through 5. When uh, Jacob was on his way, I'm sorry, when Isaac, I'm sorry, never mind. Genesis 26, 1 through 5, we see these, we see these words. Um, now there was a famine in the land beside the previous famine um, that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down into Egypt. Stay in the land in which you are, in which I tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants, I will give these lands and will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants in the land, in the, as the stars of heaven and will give your descendants all these lands and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and I kept and kept my charge, my commandments and my statutes and my laws. Now, what's rather interesting about this is it falls right in the middle of the two sins or the two problems that that Isaac had here. He favored his son Esau more than Jacob. That's shown at the in chapter 25, just previous to this. And he allowed his his wife, Rebecca, to be taken by Abimelech. Uh, following that in verse seven, following what I just read. So right smack dab in the middle of two faulty situations of showing himself to be a faulty father of Jesus Christ. Jacob was told by God, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to use you. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bless the nations through you. And of course, we recognize, of course, we recognize, of course, that he's talking about Jesus Christ coming through him ultimately, but his descendants in the nation, in the world nation, and will be, will be huge. And the world will be blessed through his descendants, through Jesus Christ. So go to the next little picture there. We see, we see in that picture, um, uh, his, uh, Isaac's son, the one we're getting ready to study about, Jacob receiving a blessing. Now that's going to be something that shows Jacob being faulty. Let's go to the next slide. God's plan to save in action as seen through the faulty father, Jacob. Now, what's rather ironic about Jacob is Jacob had another name given to him by God. We all know that name. Even if you never knew this, you know this name. His name was, his name was Israel, called by God. The children of Israel, the Jews, Israelites, called after their father, Jacob. No, you would think that you would have a name like Israelite given by God would be a very great name. And it was, it, it was a name. The word, by the way, means to struggle with God. And the, and the, and the, and the Jews most certainly did that. But these, Father Jacob or Israel followed in his faulty father's footsteps. And what do I mean by that? I mean, he was a liar. Go to Genesis chapter uh, 27, verses 18 through 24, is where we find Jacob deceiving his father Isaac. This is rather ironic. Deceiving his father Isaac um, in order to receive a blessing. Okay, he, he receives the blessing that should have gone to his elder brother Esau. Now, a lot of people want to point out Esau was not a very good man, that Esau was not the one that God had chosen. That matters neither here nor there. Jacob lied, told his father, I am Esau, as if God needed him to deceive his father Isaac in order to be able to receive the blessing. If God wanted him to have the blessing, God would have spoken to Isaac and had him give him the blessing. 
God could have done it in a number of ways. But instead, Jacob lied, got his, got his brother's blessing, told his father he was Esau. Esau blessed him. Rather ironic that uh, Esau, or that Jacob, huh, Isaac, was, was um, uh, deceived by his son, like he deceived uh, Abimelech. Again, lying just being passed down and passed down from generation. He also followed after his father's faulty footsteps. He was a respecter of sons. When you get to Genesis chapter 37, verses 3 and 4, that's where we find out that because Joseph was the son of Rachel, the firstborn son of Rachel, um, Jacob loved, Israel, loved Joseph more than his other 11 sons. He, he, he treated him in a special way gave his son a, a, a coat that required him because of the length of its, of, its, of its arm, of the arms of the coat and the way it went down across his legs. It was a coat that you would not wear if you were going to be doing hard labor. Okay, so, so he, he and his brothers were jealous because of it. And he was, a respect, he was a respecter of sons, which, by the way, affected his other sons to be very jealous. And they sinned because of it. They were guilty of their sin, but uh, Jacob played a part in it. He swindled his brother and father-in-law. I already mentioned how he swindled his brother, how he how he swindled him as far as taking his his uh, taking his uh, blessing. His father-in-law in in, Gen in chapter thirty verses thirty-one through forty-three. By the way, just to be fair, his father-in-law had also swindled him. Uh, Jacob wanted a wife. He wanted the he wanted the daughter of of, of this man, one of the daughters of his father, future father-in-law. And he ends up, yeah, Jethro. No, no, that's not right. He ends up getting Laban. He, he ends up getting a daughter, uh, the wrong one, because Laban decided, I don't want my first daughter, my second daughter to be married before the first. And so he gave, he gave Jacob Leah, Leah. And then Leah was, was uh, he had hair for a week and then, then he finally got Rachel. But that doesn't, that doesn't give um, Jacob an excuse for swindling his father-in-law out of a lot of his flock. That's a long study. You can look at it in chapter 30, verses 31 through 43. But he basically got his father-in-law to make a deal and then, and then he changed the results of the deal <laughs> Uh, by in his own actions and was able to gain a lot of his father-in-law's uh, wealth and then before he left. So he was a swindler, this Jacob. Okay, next point. God made something out of him. God used Jacob. And we know once again, in, this is what I was getting to earlier in Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 17. Genesis 28, 10 through 17 is where Jacob has a dream. He has a dream, and that dream was basically telling him that God was going to be with him. He had angels coming up and down on a ladder over his head and, and, and received from God, uh, God telling him in verse 14, your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out in the west and the east and the north and the south, and you will... And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Again, pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ was going to come through Jacob. A very sinful man that God was able to use. Okay. So in the picture we see on, the, on that slide shows a representation of what, of what he saw in his vision. But why are you doing this, Albert? Why are you pointing out how evil these people are? Um, again, I, I said in the lesson pr prior to this, um, you can go to the next slide. I said in the lesson prior to this, these men are, dis are in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Let me also mention, by the way, Judah is showed there. Judah is the tribe that Jesus came from. Therefore, obviously, he's a son of Judah, one of the 12, uh, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, one of the 12 tribes, Judah. Uh, well, Judah, what was, his, what was his sin that I'd like to bring up? Judah visited a prostitute. 
Now, why is that? I mean, yeah, that happened with a lot of those guys, and that was a very bad thing. He had a wife. He visited a prostitute. Guess who the prostitute happened to be? The prostitute happened to be the, the, the widowed wife of one of his sons, who he... <laughs> who was not able to bring about a child because he died before he could. He had promised his daughter-in-law, I am going to, I'll let you have one of my other sons when he comes of age. And then he doesn't do it. And the daughter-in-law, wanting to have a child through that bloodline, um, as and because of the promise that Judah had made, went off into another city, pretended to be a harlot, a prostitute, knowing that her father-in-law was coming by and he paid he paid uh, for the prostitute. He had sex with his daughter-in-law and brought about his son, Perez, his grandson, Perez, and came basically coming through Judah. Uh, he, he fathered a son for his son. <laughs> and so look at what we see here. The mix, the, the horrible things, the the not keeping of an oath, the committing adultery against his own wife with a prostitute. This is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Now, you might be sitting and saying to yourself, Albert, these are things that people who hate God, who want to discredit the Bible, would be bringing up. Yeah, they will. They'll bring it up. And they'll bring it up as if it's something that, that, discred that truly discredits the Bible. It doesn't. What it does is it points out the people in the Bible are no different than the people we have today. And the only thing that can possibly make them better is their connection with God, is their leaving those things behind, repenting of them, having those sins forgiven. Jesus Christ died on the cross in order that we may be able to have our sins forgiven. Are your sins any better than these men? Are their sins any worse than yours? Does it make a difference? Not really. By inspiration, Paul the Apostle in 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 1 said he was the chief of all sinners. And yet God was able to use him. Remember, he had persecuted the church. He had had many Christians murdered, drug off to prison, trying to stop God's will, trying to stop Christianity from its in its tracks from going out. You want to talk about a sinner? Or how about the people on the day of Pentecost when, when Peter tells them, you crucified the Christ? They called for him to be crucified. When, when offered the, the opportunity to have either uh, uh, Basabbas or himself released, he, they asked for the Sabbath to be leaked and not, and not Jesus Christ. In other words, for Jesus Christ to die. And Pilate said, what will you have me do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Crucify him. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 and 37, they knew exactly what they had done. They had, they had had the Christ crucified. They now believe, men and brethren, what shall we do? Within that question is a realization that if anyone has ever sinned, it's us. And God forgave them of their sin. His son put on a cross because of their words. Now, quite frankly, his son was put on the cross because of my sins and because of yours. So when we see men like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah, why do we note their sins? Well, for why do I know them in this sermon is so that we can recognize their sins could be forgiven. And they were. And so can ours. This lesson has been one to learn something from God's, God's word and from God's, the heroes in God's word. These guys were heroes, but not because of their sins, but because of their faith and their willingness to return to God in those sins. We can be like them. We're already like them in the sinful part. We can be like them in the forgiven part if we would just be willing to come to God. If you're not a Christian, you have the opportunity to become one. Believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin, confessing him, and being baptized for the purpose of your sins being forgiven. 
If you want to study on any of those things or you want to talk about that or you want to do them, please feel free to contact me or others and, and they will be willing to help you with that. If you are a Christian, but you need to make things right in your life, isn't it great that you have another breath in your lungs to go to God in prayer and make it right? To change your life, repenting of that sin, coming back to God. If there's any way that you can be helped, do something about it. Are there any announcements that need to be made before we close today? You know, uh, one announcement I certainly want to make, and I want to make it for a couple of reasons. First off, we're going to be getting together next week in the building, those who wish to come. I've already had a couple of people who, who've who contacted me and say they're not comfortable yet. They may have health conditions that they feel could be could be compromised if they were to come uh, and and because of the situations going on right now. We have set things up for that. Uh, we are going to be continuing with our Zoom and our Facebook. For that, re for that matter, even after this crisis is over, we plan on continuing with that. Our worship assembly next, next week that's going to be in the building is going to be on here just like you're watching it right now. You'll be able to see it on here. Many people are watching this who are in places where are far away from Elkins and may not be having an assembly to be able to go to or just wish to stay to, board, to be with us in our assemblies. Uh, over the air. You'll be able to have that opportunity as well. Okay, so please don't think because we're going to be at the building, what we're doing right now is going to be gone. That's going to be continuing. If you're more comfortable being at home at the moment, be for, whatever, for whatever reason, as far as uh, health concerns are concerned or, or on those lines, please do so. Feel comfortable doing so. Recognizing that you'll be able to, you'll be able to be with us again when the time is safe for you. Okay. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah. Four o'clock today, we'll be having another assembly. Don't forget that timing. Uh, and it'll be on here, of course. Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, I like the... Uh, if, if our membership, any of the, anybody viewing, uh, didn't get the outreach paper and see the write-up on our brother, Lauren. Yes. Should do that. What a wonderful man he was, uh, and what a great tribute to him that that was that artist boy. Excellent. It's a blessing. We miss him and love him. Excellent point. Just to let you know, we shared that on Facebook, and if anyone wants to see my copy, they can't get the Facebook, uh, but they'd like it digitally. We will email it to them so they can see it. Uh, we can send it out even today if you want to see it, and you're not able to see our Facebook. Let us know, and we will email it to you. And, and we're going to hang our copy up on the bulletin board of the church building. So, excellent point. Thank you, Denny. Thank you for mentioning that. Any other announcements? Let's go to God in a word of prayer. We'll see you all at 4 o'clock. Go to God in a word of prayer, and we'll be closed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word. Father, thank you for showing those in the Bible, warts and all, the, the, the fact, Father, that they, they were men and women just like us. Father, that gives us hope. That helps us, Father, when Satan is trying to convince us that there is no hope for us. If there was hope for them, there's hope for us. And we know, Father, that your word makes it clear that there is hope for us, that we need to trust in you, in your gospel, in you, what your son has done and what we are able to achieve through what he has done. Help us, Father, to always keep that in mind. Father, we love you so much for offering us salvation. And we ask you, Father, to give us the courage Accept that salvation, no matter what it costs us. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Thank you all. Thanks, Brother Albert. Appreciate all. Yep, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good having you all with us.